You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, get out, get the point good. And now, Fendo. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Hey there, hi there, ho there, everybody, and happy wacka 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 doodle Wednesday. It's a windy one out here. Uh, Barman didn't really show it, but yeah, it's a wee bit on the breezy side. Jeepers, I wonder if that has anything to do with me. I know, I'm making everything about me. (laughs) Well, maybe because I'm a little bit on the breezy side. But we're not going to talk about that, are we? So, you are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com, channel 3. Also on the RLM Radio XYZ site and lots of other RLM and Num and Num places. As well as later to be on the RLM YouTube channel and the RLM BitChute channel. So yeah, we's all over. We's everywhere. And those of you that are listening in on Spreaker... Please be sure to come on over to reallibertymedia.com, join the chat, make up a nickname, give me some static because my internet don't let me play with that many chat rooms at once. Not without things going really wonky. And wonky is way worse than wacky. Trust me. (laughs) Okay. (coughs) Excuse me. So, over here on Twitter... Thank you, Barman, for tweeting me out. Holy smokes, I'm losing stalkers like crazy. That must mean I'm really good at turning corners. That's all there is to it. I lose them in the race. That's what it is. Either that or I open my mouth and something offensive falls out. Ha! Imagine that. Oh, what's that? Don't let pain define you. Let it refine you. Ooh, sometimes I'm not into pain. Hmm... Hmm, I'm just kind of scrolling along and it looks like, ooh, hmm, there's all kind of interesting things over here on uh, Twitter, but I'm going to go ahead and close it now, because, yeah, too many things going on. Over here on Minds, hey there, everybody over here on Minds, I don't know who's paying attention and who's not. I do know that there's quite a few people that are jumping on a photo about free Palestine, And uh, most of the comments that I've seen are basically saying, they're a bunch of terrorist asshats and they deserve what they get. Who are we talking about? Israel or the Palestinians? I'm so confused because the asshats I see, (laughs) yeah, they're the ones that, but we need to have our homeland back. That's our ancestral homeland. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm wondering if maybe it's just sitting on the middle of a power grid or something to the world. And that's why they wanted it, because they wanted to control that shit. We do have magnetic ley lines, you know. Oh, well, that's been an interesting chitty chat to watch or conversation going on. Because, man, there's an, there's an awful lot of mm, people that are, yeah. Y'all need to really do a little bit more research. I'm not saying that everybody in Palestine is just absolutely wonderful, but they aren't all Arabs. They Well, let's say they aren't all Muslims either. There used to be quite a few Christians over there until we started dicking around. Yeah. Then, yeah, they kind of sort of got to pay for our bullshit. Or maybe I should say pay for Israel's bullshit. Oh, well. Over here on Freedoms Network. Yeah, I know. Rant, 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 rant. Hey, cowboy. I also see Grimner. Thank you, Grimner, for sharing me over here. I really do appreciate it. Uh, Let's see. Estrella and Loki Luck and Late In are also here. Hey there, guys. How you doing? On Fakie Book, not a whole heck of a lot of traffic over here on Fakie Book. People are busy. Busy, busy, busy doing other things. Imagine that. I'm shocked. But in the one place where you need to be, if you want to give me static, and where it really counts, over here 
in the RLM, in the chat. Bubblers away. Spreaker Freakers. Hey, there you go. Hey, Willy Wonky and the Wacko Factory. You know, um, I've, I've, yeah. <laughs> that almost sounds like a fun kind of amusement parky place to go to. Um, let's see. Uh-oh. Rob works is scared because Vinny's being a clown and a joker. So you get to see both sides of him. In other words, he's a Republican and a Democrat, all rolled into one. Hey, you do you do realize why they call them the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, don't you? Because they're having one hell of a party on our dime. We aren't invited except when it comes time to clean up and pay the tab. So, uh, bubblers going on all over the place. And there's religion utters and psychotic killers all over the place. Yeah, I know, Grimmy. Christians were ever so peaceful and wonderful as well. That Those were those same people that uh, burned people at the stake because they're a witch. They're a witch. Which witch? Which witch was a witch? Hmm. Yeah. There ain't, as far as I'm concerned, there ain't a single religion utter out there that uh, I'm willing to say, yeah, I'm one of them. No. No. I not. I not. Oh, well, in the RLM, right up top, I see Barman, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world, closely followed by Grimner, who is the RLM god, don't you know? And if you want to be a religiosity kind of person, don't go there, because Grim will smite your ass. <laughs> I also see the lovely Kate is in the house. Hey there, Kate. How's things down in the great state of Florida? And looky there, Asmodeus Asmo is in the house, as well as the lovely Beth Z. I saw both of them chatting earlier. I think that was, no, it wasn't today. That was yesterday. Must have been yesterday. The lovely Chloe and Chloe the Hippie are both here. Hey, cool beans. I'm here, as well as Ibe Doncy and Ibe Doncy Wike. I also see a double dose of Java, 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 Doctor. He's got one and the new and improved version. Looky there, JJ's 99 is here, as well as Juana Taco. No thanks, hon. I'm full. I have fried chicken. Mmm, mmm, she can. <laughs> I love that movie. Uh, the lovely Rain is in the house. Hey there, Rain, as well as the lovely RLM Fluke, the Vanna White of the RLM channel. And looky there, Rob Works, who has been firing up that bubbler and beat me to the duck, even though he had to put the bubbler down to do it. Well, I was pushing other buttons and not breaking things, okay? So, I'll hug a duck later. <laughs> or duck a hug or some such thing. Uh, yeah, don't get smitten by the grim finger. That's right. <laughs> if Grimmy had the power to smite, I think there would be an awful lot less people here. Talk about population reduction. <laughs> oh, well. Let's see, where was I at? Oh, excuse me. That trusty feller, trust no one, is in the house. Hey, trusty feller, I really miss Darth Rome's, but trusty works as well. I also see Beetle. Hi, Beetle. How's things in your world? And looky there, Colfax 101, as well as Dakota, who's been having some wild and wacky w uh, weather up in that neck of the woods. Um, Vinianity. Oh, Vinny, hon, if you want to go ahead and start a religion, that's fine. We can call you a little religion utter. Tell you what, I have some sheets. I'll give you a sheet, and I'll make a, some poster board, and you can go stand on a street corner and tell people the end is nigh. There's a religion utter for you. That would be fun. You could... You could, I'll bet you you would make friends and influence people, Vinny. I know you would. I know you. I also see Dima is in the house, as well as Frumpy and Frumpy 32, as opposed to Frumpy 42, which is the meaning of life. I also see Kozu is in the house, as well as Moy, 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 and a pox upon many things, a pox upon a box, and on a fide, and on a phone, and finally a pox on your home. There's lots of poxies in the chit-chat. I also see Pompa Ponsauce is here, as well as Skittle. 
Skittle likes to have oral sex with lots of things. He's always dropping that, or she is always dropping that F-bomb in the chat. <laughs> Every time I see Skittle comment, the F-bomb is in there somewhere. Hey, Vinny, Vinny, Vinnyanity. He's trying to start a new religiosity. Hmm. And to round out the crew, the one, the only, the Phantom of the Opera. Or the Phantom of the Chat. Or the Phantom of the Internet. Well, he's a phantom. No one knows. Who knows what evil lurks in the heart of men? Uh, everyone in the Bilderberg group. Pretty much. Okay, let me see. Where do I want to go first? Hmm. Uh, da -da. I, I threw some things in my pocket, and I also, um, yes, I got flash iron going on. 3264. Ah, oh, that's one half, Rob. I can do math. <laughs> Vinny, you're pointing around the corner. Way cool. Get, do you have one of them bendy fingers, too? My family used to laugh at me like, because one of my index fingers goes wonky. And it's not, I mean, it's not that the finger is not, well, it's, it's as straight as a finger can be. But when I point, it goes, yeah, I see you, Rob. <laughs> I'm not ready to drop that kind of F-bombs. Let's see. Okay, where do I want to go first? Hmm. Because I see stuff about Palestine that's just infuriating as all get out. And all these silly ass people that seem to think that, yeah, Israel deserves that. Oh, I know what I think Israel deserves, but there's probably quite a few people that disagree with me. Mm, um, let's see. Do I want to go with... Here we go. We'll just we'll just go with this one, just because. You know, cause cause I'm talking about religion utters and 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 Israel and some of these other things and and those are actually you know thought processes are really uh um uh, you know your beliefs are a habit. It's a thought that has become a habit for you, and so this is from PickTheBrain.com. Ten habits. And misunderstandings to toss, throw them away. This is by M Bella Maya Carter. So, I just I thought that I saw that and I thought, ah, a self help. Let's do this, shall we? So, most of us associate spring cleaning with physical objects. We roll up our sleeves and clear out our closets and drawers. And if we're feeling ambitious or preparing to move. Well, we might even tackle the attic or the garage. You know, I tackled the garage, and I made it halfway. <laughs> and I went, I can still get my car in and out. <laughs> oh, well, and the mower in and out. So what am I doing here? It's hot. In any case, <clears throat> we know we have too much stuff. And we want to lighten out the load. And it feels great when we release our junk and shed what no longer serves us. Ooh, that's what I'm doing. I'm not venting. I'm releasing my junk. And one man's junk is another man's treasure. Moving along. Our lives benefit tremendously when we do this on the physical plane, but also on the psychological realm. It's important to know that it is safe to let go. And here are a few things that you can toss that will make a huge difference in your life. Number one, worry. Stop future tripping. Worry is a meditation on shit, according to Mark Ruffalo in the film, Thanks for Sharing. But this author would add that uh, future shit, that's what you're meditating on. Worry is a warped form of mental preparedness, and we think that if we worry about something, we'll be prepared for it. Well, Don Joseph Gowie, who is author of End of Stress, discusses a study that proves that 85% of what we worry about 
never happens. And he quotes the great essayist Michael de Mon Montaigne, who wrote, My life has been filled with terrible misfortune, most of which never happened. See, I know an awful lot of people that worry about, but what if I, but what if this, but what if, but, 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 what if? I don't know. What if? You're not going to ever find out unless you step out there. Stop your stewing and worrying. And no, worry does not give you gray hair. I really don't worry all that much. I mean, I do worry occasionally, but not all that often, and I still have lots and lots of gray hair. So, number two, the illusion of control. Yeah, give it up. Give it up. Forget about it. Surrender your resistance to those things over which you have zero control. Zero. We humans love to believe that we're in control. We exert what appears to be our control in large and small ways. But sooner or later, we find ourselves up against force beyond our control. The healthiest thing to do at times like this is to accept what is. This is not always easy, especially when things don't go our way. We might kick and scream inside or throw an actual tantrum. But sooner or later, if we don't accept the truth of our circumstances, we'll exacerbate our own suffering. Which also goes, excuse me, you know, if you stop and think about it, DC really is out of control. I mean, it's, it's overrun with control freaks. And when you put that many control freaks in one little area, there is no control whatsoever. It's just madness. It's pandemonium. It's bedlam. It's just, it's nuts. And so why do we even bother worrying about what the hell those asshats are doing? Number one, they're way, way, way over there. Number two, yes, they probably could do all kinds of nastiness to us. Yes, they are doing all kinds of nastiness to us. But if it's not directly affecting us right now, there really isn't anything I mean, seriously, there isn't anything that you can do right now unless you are able to flip a switch and shut them off. You, so why worry about them? Deal with what you got going on right in front of you. Control what you can control, and the rest of it that you can, can't can control, well, just if you live through it, then learn from it. And don't get yourself in that situation again. That's my thoughts. Number three, preoccupation with others' thoughts, especially about you. You know, what other people think of you is none of your business. Yeah, none of your business. Make it a mantra. What other people think of me is none of my business. Be your own person. Listen to your own wisdom. You will make mistakes and you will learn from them. Or they will return until you have learned your lessons. And really, what other people, you cannot change someone else's mind for them. You can't, that's another one of those things you have zero control over. You may be able to influence in some way or another, but ultimately they have to form their own opinion. So no matter what you do, you cannot change their opinion if they don't wish to change it. And if they think you're a, to you know, a floater in the toilet, well, you know what? You don't have to wear that label. And maybe, just maybe, you think that's what they are too. And guess what? They don't have to wear that label either. So, eh. Number four. The old I'm not good enough story. Oh, I've heard this shit before. Don't believe the lie that you're not good enough. I don't care who you are or what you've done. You are good enough. You are a human being worthy of love and respect. You are on your path. You may get lost, but that's part of the journey. 
No one person is better than another. Being rich doesn't make you better. Success doesn't make you better. You're not better because of a fancy education or because of your dress size. There is no better. We are all equally worthy, so let go of your doubts, show up, and do the best you can. There's no one to impress except yourself. That was my little bit, that except yourself. No judges evaluating you every move. Life is an adventure, so play the game your way. My only caveat that I would add to that is without intentionally harming another. Go out there, have fun, don't worry about, okay, so what, so somebody's got this fancy schmancy car. Yeah, they got fancy schmancy insurance rates and fancy schmancy this and fancy schmancy that too to go along with it. And you know what, someone that needs to have that kind of fancy schmancy to get from point A to point B, wow, talk about, you know, trying to show the world how wonderful you are by a material object as opposed to by your own actions and how well you speak and treat another. Number five, unproductive fear. Know the difference between productive and unproductive fear. Productive fear is a response to a real threat in our environment. It is a present moment focused and keeps us safe. Destructive fear depends or happens in our heads. It stems from our imagination, from scary or unpleasant stories that we tell ourselves about something that happened in the past or that might but probably won't happen in the future. You know, there's that whole worry thing. And it's important to start to identify the two and how they show up in your life. She also discusses this in a further essay of hers, which is Writing Naked, The Benefits of Exposing Yourself Through Memoir. Huh, I may have to read that one. Number six, the need for certainty. Give it up. Ain't nothing certain. Uncertainty is one of the few certainties of life. <laughs> That's kind of sort of bad backwards, but okay. So while some people may have some psychic ability, most of us don't know what's going to happen in the future. And needing to know what's impossible to know causes suffering. You know, you really, f you build up your stress levels, which affects your immune system, which makes you more susceptible to other diseases in your body. So. Stop worrying about it. Quit trying to be, I need to know what's going to happen. Every, no, you don't. Number seven, <clears throat> retail therapy. I know people do this shit. Stay out of stores. Spending money may make you feel better for a little while, but its satisfaction is short-lived. In fact, you will feel worse than you felt before your spree if you spent money you didn't have on stuff you don't need. Yeah. See, now, I'm one of those people that, that you know, when I'm kind of sort of bummer duded, if I'm in town, I window shop. I'll go and I will check out all kind of shit. And while I'm checking it out, I'll look at the price tag, which really is a moot subject anyway but I look at it and I look at the bobble and I go is it worth dusting for the next five years is it worth doing laundry how many times am I going to wear it am I and I yeah and that's you know it's that's a little therapy for me but I I rarely rarely purchase anything just because I don't need more stuff number eight clutter Resist the temptation to crowd your space. Every object you own has energy attached to it. It is as if each object had invisible strings connecting us to it. And after a while, these invisible strings begin to weigh us down. Puppet strings, if you will. And if you're surrounded by stuff you don't like, it robs you of energy and prevents the flow of energy around you. 
So assess your space to see what you might be able to get or to uh, let go of, which, ooh, I'm looking around and <laughs> I've actually, in this room, culled the herd considerably, so yeah, this room's okay. Now, you go into the spare bedroom or the basement, and <laughs> that's a whole other story that I need to get busy on. In any case, number nine, comparisons. Yeah, all of us hate comparisons. It's a waste of our precious time and energy to compare ourselves to anybody else. Facebook has made this unfortunate habit difficult to avoid. And what's worse is that we compare our interior lives with other people's outer ones. Things are rarely as they appear, especially on social media. Don't compare yourself to anyone, but the person that you aspire to be. Actually, I prefer to compare myself to who I was yesterday and see if I have taken a step up or a step back, or if I'm still on that same spot. Because if, you know, no matter where I'm at, it's all good because I'm still here. That means I still have options. But that's the only person I really compare myself to anymore. It's like, eh, you know, it, it really doesn't really doesn't do any good to compare to someone else because the, the, the odds are they're comparing to someone else that I'd be going, dude, seriously? Wow. In any case, the last one, number 10, anger. Forgive yourself and others. Holding on to your anger is like carrying a burning coal in your hand. The only one that's hurting is you. Spring cleaning is great any time of the year, and it feels great to let go of things, physical as well as mental, that don't serve you. So clearing habits that prevent you from living the large and luminous life that you were meant to live will free you. So take stock, be honest, pay attention, and know that you are safe no matter what. Create space for inspiration and magic to enter your life may be easier to let go of physical things first, so yeah, go ahead and start that, which I do. I did. I get rid of at least a, one trash bag, one lawn and leaf trash bag full of whatever a, a month, and I really have thinned down a lot of stuff. So you can start with the physical things, but be brave. Toss ten things that you don't need today. And while you're cleaning, ideas just might pop into your mind regarding deeper clearing efforts. So stay open, listen to your wisdom and inspiration, and have fun. Have fun. And that, that number 10 with the anger, with forgiving yourself, you do realize that when you offer forgiveness to someone, really the only person that's being forgiven is yourself. I mean, you may... You may say, I forgive you for your behavior, but really, that is their behavior. That's on them. It's how you took it, how it, how it interacted with your world. And offering forgiveness is basically allowing yourself to move past that. It's not forgetting. I, I'm a big advocate of forgive yourself, but don't forget what that other person did, so you don't set yourself up for it again. But I thought that was rather interesting. I wonder how old she is. Oh, she's also the author of Secrets of My Sex. Well, I don't know that I want to go there. <laughs> but, yes... Um, <coughs> what is that? G millions. Oh. Okay. Viral blog post claims that new automobiles are piling up around. Ah, yes, new vehicles are piling up like crazy because nobody can afford the damn things. Seriously, I used to work in the car industry. I know how that shit works. And there's a wonderful thing. Um, 
that, um, okay, brain fart. I read Rob works and then my mind just, thanks, Rob. It's like you did a bubbler kind of thing. <sighs> you just wiped my mind. It's gone. It's gone. Whatever it was. I know it was about cars. But, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I remember now. You know, a lot of people think that the car dealerships are the ones that really make the money off of those new vehicles. No. No. They don't make much money off of new vehicles. Actually, they don't make a whole hell of a lot of money off of used vehicles either. Where they make money is in the service department. Getting you coming back for the service work. That's the only place that they really make it. That's what keeps the roof over their head and the bills paid. But, yeah, nobody can buy new cars anymore. Damn things are so freaking expensive, they're insane. Okay, let me share this over here on uh, FN site as well. And then I have, actually, I've got a few blogs that... I thought were kind of interesting. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Do this one. We'll do that. Apparently, it does not wish to post this over. There it goes. There it goes. Okay. Now, where's the. Da -da. Okay, do I want to go with Jordan Peterson, or do I want to go with, nah, or do I want to go with, how about, nope, nope, don't want to go there. Okay, where did I put that? <laughs> I'm always misplacing things. Okay, there, I think I found it. Yes, flasher, flasher. Okay. Nope. That's not the one I was thinking of. Dang it. Okay, let me see if this is it. I have so damn much shit in my pocket. <laughs> I really need to clean the clutter up in there. Seriously. Okay. This is from wakeupworld.com. Um, the oxymoron war on terror, the greatest hypocrisy of our time. And it has a little quote here. We cannot be both the world's leading champion of peace and the world's leading supplier of weapons of war. Yeah, yeah. So, Terrorism is a noun. It's the unlawful use of violence and intimidation in pursuit of political aims. And the war is politically motivated violence. War is, therefore, terrorism, enshrined in the law of one warring party. Now, by its definition, war threatens and enacts violence on behalf of the state for its own benefit, you know, national security, and at the expense of the lives and livelihoods of countless others. And yet, we've come to accept their invasion, their suppression, and even their deaths as necessary to our lives, to our sense of peace and tranquility, for national security don't you know? So, we occupy lands, we kill leaders, we overturn cities in the hunt for weapons that don't exist, and all because the lawmakers who decide which violent acts are war and which are terrorism tell us such violence is necessary to achieve peace. We must bomb them back into the Stone Age in order for us to feel secure. It's like a security blanket. They took away our security blanket and now we don't even have our binky. So we must bomb them into obscurity. Yeah. So remind me again, who are the terrorists? And who are the heroes? And who are the war criminals? 
And how do we discern military from militia? Do we really believe peace can be achieved by declaring war on war itself? Uh, you know, Buckminster Fuller, what was that? If you don't like the current system, stop fighting against it. Create one that makes it obsolete. It's not easy, not a quick fix, but the greatest hypocrisy of our time is the world's political institutions, from the U.S. to Russia, from Israel to ISIS. They seek to gain and maintain power through the use of violence, terror, and military coercion. In fact, we live in a world where legally sanctioned acts of terrorism are carried out more often than illegal terrorism. There is illegal terrorism. I thought it was all considered quote unquote legal. You know, it's all legal. Doesn't make it right, but I'm sure someone put some squiggly lines on some paper and said, I hereby declare this legal. Yeah. But as they are conducted within someone else's border in someone else's homeland, we separate ourselves from this reality in a dissonant attempt to protect ourselves from it. Yes, first they came for. And then when no one's left, who's going to come, who's going to stand up when they come for me? Never forget that everything Hitler did in Germany was legal. Martin Luther King. I know, Rascal, are you helping? My key cat's up here helping. So, whether we are conscious of it or not, we are each deeply and profoundly disturbed, excuse me, by the war world we live in. We are disturbed that hate is the language of our leaders. We're disturbed that we send our sons and daughters away to participate in it. Stop doing that. We are disturbed that we allow it. Yeah. And we are disturbed by feeling we are unable to do anything about it. Most of us, war has been an ever-present part of our lives. And we accept the state of war as a state of normal simply because it has always been that way. And, you know, that was one of those little comments that someone had made over on Mines on the Israel occupation of Palestine. Well, you know, people have been occupying and taking over and moving people and all this other fun stuff since time immemorial. Okay, just because you've been doing something wrong for eons, the eons of doing that, whatever it is, does not make it right. If it's wrong the first time, it's wrong the last time. It's wrong, 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 wrong. Wrong. Just because you keep doing it doesn't make it any more right. You know, it's like that old saying, two wrongs do not make a right. Well, eons of wrongs do not make it right. They just make it to where it's acceptable. It's like a uh, former congressman when I asked him, so when are you going to call out the POTUS on this bullshit of executive orders? Executive orders do not create law. Executive orders are meant to stipulate how uh, governmental agencies are to perform what is a law how to you know it they do not make law the executive is the administration it is the administrator it is the one that stipulates how you carry out it does not say okay now you're going to do this and now you're going to do that and just make shit up and he said well you know they've been doing I know that but they've been doing it like this for years and my rebuttal to him was and just because they've been doing it wrong for years doesn't mean you have to continue doing it. And he said, well, that's kind of, and it's like, never mind, forget it. You're done. You're, and he did not make it in this last round, which, oh, darn. In any case, back to this article. <clears throat> yeah. The United States has been at war for 224 years out of the last 241. Not one U.S. president qualifies as a solely peacetime president. And the only time the United States lasted five years without going to war was between 1935 and 1940, during the period of the Great Depression. 
sadly, but true to form. America centered its post-depression economic recovery around its military industry. Subsequently, every U.S. POTUS since the end of World War II, from Truman to Kennedy to Eisenhower to Nixon, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, W., and Dangleberry, enacted a presidential doctrine directly pertaining to war, either by inviting U.S. involvement in conflict or inciting it directly. Today, with POTUS Trumple Stilskin, Having just assumed office, the military industry, industry is critical to the survival of the U.S. economy and indeed of the United States of America. Employing 3.5 million Americans and generating over 300 billion, with a B, in revenue each year for private military companies. That's a lot of cha-ching. So call it what you will, such institutionalization of war is terrorism. It does not matter how crazy or legitimate their goals are perceived to be. Violence in order to express a point is terrorism. But with a warring mentality firmly embedded in both the psyche and economy of the United States, Americans have not learned the lessons of history and failed presidential policy and allow these systems of war to continue on their behalf under the Orwellian guises of liberty and peacekeeping and freedom because, you know, they hate us for our freedoms because we feel so free to just drop bombs all over their heads. However, the reality shows us that the result of those systems is anything but free, anything but peaceful, anything but liberating. So it's basically an institutional thinking and the, and the mind of the state. Deception is a state of mind and the mind of the state. That's from James Angleton. So no matter how confusing the war on terror becomes, no matter the geopolitics involved, no matter who is wearing which uniforms or what book they hold or flag they fly, people who kill and die in the name of institutional abstracts are terrorists. Whether they are lawmakers, rebels, military soldiers, suicide bombers, or heads of state, those who willingly kill and terrify on behalf of a geopolitical agenda are terrorists, period. Those who do so are conned, convinced through varying levels of propaganda, and the most obvious yet diabolical form is friendly old Uncle Sam beckoning young unemployed teens to see the world by his side. But isn't it just our troops who've been conned? No, we Americans are proud to see our children put boots to the ground, primarily 18 to 21, 21 years old, and engage or kill the enemy. We celebrate their successes, killings, and mourn their losses, being killed. We have learned to euphemistically minimize deaths as casualties, collateral damage, when there's nothing casual about it. We falsely believe the killing and maiming of innocent civilians to be the exception and not the rule of war, rationalize killing and dying in the name of perverted, monolithic, geopolitical, ideologies. Talk about religion utters. Believing in the almighty government. What they tell you. But it's patriotic. National security. Don't you know? The only security y'all are worried about, you know, if, seriously, if they were really worried about national security, 
If they really were, they would haul their sorry asses onto the front lines, and they would lead the charge. But no, no, they're worried about their financial security and their retirement funds. And, well, they're very well invested in all of these other companies that uh, make all these little goo and gadgets and doodahs that go on all of these military items. Yeah. That's the national security they're talking about. So, whatever way you look at it, using violence to coerce is terrorism. Period. Not only is it commonplace, it's the design of our society's institutions. From the more obvious government and military institutions to the less obvious nuclear energy inter industry, which feeds materials to nuclear weapons programs, and the media, which portrays the acts of war as perfect alignment with government rhetoric. Yes, the machinery of war is so commonplace in the United States that we can't even see the problem, let alone begin to define it. Now make no mistake, the cause of violence and terror today is our so-called leaders. They control the military might to destroy entire countries, yet claim to not have the resources to simply defend our borders against attack preferring instead to enact preemptive strikes because, well, those people over there, they look different and they dress different and I don't understand the way they talk and that's scary, so they're probably going to do something and, and so we should bomb them. Yeah, do those preemptive strikes on foreign soil because it's over there, not in our face and to attack first rather than defend. Invariably, such policies require increasingly authoritative, punitative, and even fascist policies on home soil to keep the confused and disturbed public in line. You know, you GPs, you general publics. So, to put an end to the U.S. doctrine of perpetual war, we need to stop asking why individuals resort to acts of terrorism and ask why we allow institutions to do so as example to world's individuals. Yeah, our government, the government of USA, is setting a fine example of being the biggest bully on the block. So why is terrorism increasing? Why would a terrorist sacrifice their own life to inflict harm on an individuals? What are they responding to? Well, look no further than the reality of the behavior exhibited by the world's leaders. If another nation's policy or politician is disliked, debate. If you don't get your way, drop bombs on entire populations and take over their nation by force even if it requires complete fabrication and propaganda. WMDs, anyone? To gain public support. The simple terms extreme militarism can only lead to the rise of extremist terrorism, the response of violent resistance to acts of violent imperialism. One cannot exist without the other. They are two sides of the same devastating and irreconcilable coin. So, in more complex terms, however, violence is the result of conflicting ideologies. Our warring institutions don't just drop bombs to destroy enemy cities and bases. They're attempting to eradicate alternative quote-unquote enemy ways of thinking and being because they're different because they're over there because they would not give us what we wanted just given it to us they actually expected us to pay for it how unrealistic is that yeah 
This is evidenced by the way the war on terror has become a war on Islam, a war on American privacy, a war on our freedoms of speech, and even our right to peacefully assemble. Government transparency is at an all-time low, while public surveillance and corporate media manipulation are at an all-time high. This is a war for your thinking and being. A war on what you think and what you do. And in the process, our warring institutions are not just imposing authoritarianism on the population they claim to represent, they are seeking to impose American-style freedom on other diverse nations by force. Perpetuating a culture at home that accepts and even supports perpetual conflict while conducting their wars abroad so that only others suffer for their misdeeds. In this way, we're never forced to confront the stark reality of our nation's wars beyond the carefully selected images that we see on our programming devices. You know, those tell-lie visions. So once again, who are the terrorists and who are the war heroes? And really, how the hell do we tell the difference? Oh, see you, Vinny. So, what's the difference between an IED, homemade bomb, and an RPG, which is a rocket-propelled grenade? The reality is both are used to kill and influence for political ends, to influence thinking and being. Both are extremely effective at ending lives, thereby engendering more violence. No matter what side a terrorist is on, they all use the same methods of violence. They all create the same outcome, more violence. The only difference is in the way that we think. The war mentality both encourages and is encouraged by separation, not oneness. One of the best ways to gain and maintain power is to keep the people in constant fear in fear of wars, of outsiders, and terrorism. Built on a narrative of us versus them. A culture of war-minded fear ensures the public consent to the constant funding of the military-industrial complex under the guise of security and protection. In war, institutions and collective thinking become the focus. The us becomes our country, our flag, our boys overseas, or more accurately, our industrial war identity. Indeed, the only entities to ever benefit from war are the individuals who hide behind warring institutions and the legal formalities that enshrine them. Those who control the military-industrial complex and the private companies that support it have arranged things so that, by design, no matter how the national fervor plays out, no matter what happens or which side wins, they still prosper, one way or the other, and have the protection of their own domestic laws. But, as President Jimmy Carter so rightly pointed out, America cannot be both the world's champion of peace and the world's major supplier of weapons. So with war institutionalized and sold to the public as a legal instrument of peace, it was inevitable that we find ourselves in the perpetual and hypocritical cycle of war and conflict that we see today. And so where are the peacemakers? Where are the protagonists of peace? 
Well, today, it is not just the United States that is built on the foundation of war, because nations around the world pour their resources into preparing for war. Why? Because the big bully on the block is getting ready to kick sand in their face. That's why. And they're reinforcing, polarizing us and them, that thinking at home, espousing the virtues of imperialism and endless growth, and promoting violent intervention as the only way to achieve it. But the United States is becoming the worst type of nation imaginable. It enacts increasingly anti-individual post or pro-institutional domestic laws and is home to the biggest prison population and private prison industry in the world. It employs the biggest military budget in the world while scrimping on domestic, social, and infrastructure development, and it preempts war with other nations and aggressively establishes military bases on their borders, all while ma maintaining its position as the world's leading manufacturer of we military weaponry. So in the process, the United States is transformed from a state that is at peace promotes peace and yet is prepared for defense into a state that is at war, promotes war, and prepares for war, but uses the Orwellian language of peace. No wonder the American people are so confused. So let's boil this down to simple terms. Imagine this. There's four bordering states in a contentious region of the world. One state is of peace, is constantly at peace, and prepares for peace. Another state is of war, is constantly at war, and prepares for war. Another state is at war, yet prepares for war, and yet is ready for peace. And the last state is at peace, prepares for peace, and yet is ready for defense. So there's many ways each state may act and react to this situation. But inevitably, the warring state will eventually arrive at the border of the purely peaceful state, and the peaceful state will likely concede. The warring state will arrive at the border of the other nations of war, and will either fight just enough to maintain a status quo of conflict, yeah, kind of like Vietnam, or fight until one side, one side loses all, while the other side loses a lot, by the way. Now imagine the winning war state arriving at the border of the peaceful state that is ready for self-defense. Inevitably, the war state will decide it's, um, it is not worth the confrontation. That is, not without first infiltrating and subverting the nation's institutions, instilling chaos and discontent, and steering its culture toward war-mindedness. Does that sound paranoid? Well, the reality of this tactic was clearly evidenced by last year's George Soros email hack, which revealed the United States government collaborator and therefore war criminal Soros funds color revolutions, which is fake grassroots uprisings, through a range of offshore NGOs or non-governmental organizations, yeah, which specialize in propaganda and the overthrow of dem democratically elected foreign governments. This cunning strategy amounts to the covert terrorism of a society's consciousness. Nonetheless, peaceful preparedness has proven to be a nation's best protection against the imperialism of war-minded nations, including one's own government. It forces warring institutions to abandon plans for outright conflict and invested programs of social infiltration. Indeed, cultural subversion is the only way a peacefully prepared nation can be drawn into conflict regardless of pretext. And that 
is where you and I come into the picture. So, do you want war on terror or peace on Terra? Terra, which is a noun, is land or territory. Origin, Latin, meaning Earth. The truth is that we live in a world of states that prepare for war and are at war. We invest trillions in building mechanisms that can destroy our planet, but neglect to build systems that can benefit our planet and benefit us. We do not design systems that facilitate peace, but which hinder each other in war. We know and accept war and lies, but we do not know how to help each other. We have to change our mind state. If we are to survive, our systems of war and destruction must be morphed into systems of support and creation and our culture must morph right along with it. We have to uplift each other. And quite frankly, you cannot do any morphing until the mindset shifts first. First, you must have the thought, the mindset, then put it into action. Now, this author says that I am a terraist. I stand for the earth and its inhabitants. I strive to be at peace, to act in peace, and to promote peace. I am always, yeah, I am always ready to defend myself, to defend others around me, to defend the earth that we call home, and to defend peace itself. And I know I'm not alone. I am prepared to die, but there is no cause for which I am prepared to kill. That was Gandhi. A terrorist embody the exact opposite values of terrorists. They do not prize the abstract notions of power and ideology, but value the real, the natural, and the living. Terrorists act to protect and provide for all individuals' needs with compassionate understanding. Terrorists are the people who realize that there's more terrorist fight the further from peace we descend. Terrorists build, protect, and help others for no reason other than what is right. And terrorists are prepared to defend against those terrorists both in and out of uniform who destroy and kill for reasons they believe justifies their violence. And trust me, there is no justification for that. So, to all terrorists out there, to those peaceful individuals without uniform, doctrine, or dogma, it's time to stand up and be counted. Be a terrorist for peace, rather than a terrorist for a piece of the pie. Be a terrorist of insight rather than a terrorist who insights. Build, create, defend, and help for no other reason than it's right. And in today's war world, it is our only option. The way to global peace isn't paved with war. History has shown us that dedicating our resources toward creating war doesn't lead or doesn't lead to more war. It makes war an economic necessity, imperiling us all. The only way to ensure peace in our world is to adopt a doctrine of peace, to give peace a budget, give peace a mandate, and give peace all our energy, both politically and personally and remove from government through the power of our will and the weight of our numbers any individual who fails to act on it. Do not be tricked into thinking that violence by the state is not terrorism. Do not be duped into becoming a terrorist fighting terrorists, mistakenly believing 
there will later come an opportunity to become a peaceful terrorist once the war is over. The reality is the war will never be over unless terrorists around the world unite and take action on behalf of humanity, Terra, and all her inhabitants. Why, thank you, Ethan. Ethan Indigo Smith wrote that. And yeah, I don't, I don't support any regime, if you will, but I do support the critters that live around me and the individuals that live around me and the plants that live around me, although there's a couple of trees that are going to have to come out because they're mostly dead anyway. And, you know, if you go through life with a supportive attitude as opposed to a... Uh, competitive attitude, you'd be surprised how easily your mind starts to shift. Support what you agree with and work, work towards making more of that. But unfortunately, we have created the monsters that hate us now. And I mean we as a colloquial collective we. I know there's lots of us list or lots of you listening and myself included. I have never done anything to to actually go out there and, and say yes we need to do this. But I haven't actually done anything to step out there and say we need to stop this shit. You know other than on the radio and okay I'm talking global wise. Now, in my own little area, yeah, I've called out bullshit and pointed out better ways of doing things. But, you know, sometimes, sometimes people just flat ass do not want to hear. Do not. Oh, well. Wow. Two articles. Two, two. Now, let's see. One more along these lines. I don't remember if I did this one or not. Um. I don't think I did. <coughs> From governmentslaves.info Follow the money, how the monetary system is rigged to enslave humanity. Yep. You know, if we could just drop the money. Oh, well. According to Robert Chatwin, no one is immune to debt, and the majority of us are in some form of financial debt. Studies show that not having enough money and especially being in debt causes serious physical and mental distress. This article investigates why banks put people into debt and uncovers why a world without any debt is completely possible. Now the modern, modern word bank stems from the word banca used in Italy during the Middle Ages but the goldsmiths of the 17th century England are often cited as uh, where contemporary banking began. Now, in those days, people would deposit their gold for safekeeping with goldsmiths who issued a piece of paper or promissory note for the gold stored. The goldsmiths then loaned the depositors gold out to others in the form of further promissory notes making good profits from the interest that they charged. Today, when you deposit money in your chosen commercial bank, the bank also loans out your deposited money to others. Now, this clever system of making profits out of nothing is called fractional reserve lending and is explained simply in the video that's attached to this. However, 
the very first sophisticated banks can actually be traced back to the very first known civilizations. The 6,000 year old ancient culture of Sumer in the area of Mesopotamia, where the Sumerian kings used a kingdom's bank which issued clay tokens as receipts or promissory notes for interest repayments made with silver. Now kings using banks as a tool to rule over people obviously paints a much more negative picture of our monetary system than evolution from barter. Yet if we critique the use of money from this perspective, it becomes clear that it is now the world's central banks that have this sovereign power or control over kingdoms or nations today. This is because central banks do not carry out fractional reserve lending of money stored in their vaults like commercial banks. Instead, their role is to actually create a nation's official money or legal tender. Now the central banks then loan out that money to the nation's government and the people pay back the government's debt as well as the interest the government incurs when it borrows the money via income tax on wages. So the government's debt is then expanded by commercial banks through loans to the public with further interest. And since the extra money needed to pay back all this interest does not exist, central banks need to keep creating more money so there is enough money in circulation. This causes the value of each individual banknote to decrease. So prices go up, inflation, and people now have to work even more hours, not just to pay all the interest back, but now also to buy the things they could afford before. And the central banking system is explained in more detail in another documentary that's attached to this. It was in 1694 when the King of England required funds for a war against France. That incredibly wealthy private individual provided that money in return for the formation of the Bank of England. In this instance, private banking families first gained huge direct influence over king and government and by 1783 when America won its independence from England, the Founding Fathers were well aware of the perils of private central banks, for the Bank of England had outlawed the interest-free independent currency that had brought prosperity to the colonies, thus creating the hardship and despair that Benjamin Franklin claimed was true or was the true cause of the American Revolution. Yet the power and influence of the dominant, also inbreeding, banking families had now become immense. And investigations into the cause of the panic of 1907 suggest that deliberately triggered bank runs on some of the increasingly successful and profitable smaller trusts by spreading insolvency rumors that would cause several of them to fail. In 1910, a secret meeting between these banking elites, Senator Nelson Aldrich and Assistant Secretary to the Treasury Department, A.P. Andrews, was held on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. It was there that the central banking bill called the Federal Reserve Act was drawn up. Then, only 16 years after the Federal Reserve was instated, it substantially increased the money supply, increasing unsustainable lending and borrowing, just like 1907. Had bank runs, bankruptcies, and systemic collapse occurred. But as the U.S. experienced the Great Depression, the elite money trust bankers had already pulled their money out of the stock market using it to buy up cheap stocks and smaller failing banks. Now as technology develops, the techniques for loaning out and gambling with money have become more convoluted. 
but the pump and dump scheme continues to consolidate wealth and power with those in the know, while the ordinary working person is literally paying the price. Today, the richest 1% own more than the other 99% put together. And 62 people own as much wealth as the poorest half of the entire world's population. It is essential then to consider, since a person can only spend so much money in one lifetime, why these people are accumulating all this wealth. Why? because they're just greedy little asshats, apparently. Obviously, they are trying to fill a void. That's pretty obvious to this old broad. Honey, pumping money into that void ain't going to fill it. You're just going to make the void bigger. So what can we do? It is important to note that the central bank of all central banks is the Bank for International Settlements with its 60 member central banks which work to establish monetary and financial stability while also intrinsically involved in the International Monetary Fund along with 189 member countries as well as the World Bank whose goal is to yeah quote unquote end extreme poverty not poverty just the extreme one of it but the facts demonstrate that the aim of the world's wealthiest and most secretive individuals has never been to create stability or to end poverty, but rather to control governments and monopolize hunger, deciding who eats and who does not. Not only that, but studies repeatedly show that people are not born greedy but rather those people who seek wealth and power suffer from psychological personality disorders including psych uh, psychopathology and narcissism but the most important fact of all is perhaps that this central banking elite can only rule over people as long as we allow them to do so as we allow them to do so in other words, the monies that central banks produce today is fiat money or faith promissory notes, meaning it's not backed by gold or silver, it cannot be redeemed in any material form, and it actually has no material value. So in other words, the value of money comes entirely from the central bank's promise that the money itself has some intrinsic value. And the use of fiat money and the necessity to pay bank debt depends entirely on people's belief that they need to actually do so. So, This is basically based on the Ubuntu contributionism, which Michael Tellinger is a large proponent of. And, um, yeah, if we allow it to continue, it will continue. We just need to, and it's, it's, you know, it's going to be a slow process because we got here a very slow process. If you are a terrorist, you are the enemy. Why? Really? Hmm. Thanks, trust no one. <laughs> okay, looks like it's about time I head over to the pig, see what happened this date in history. 0606-2018. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um. Don't want to do that one. I do have one other one that I'm going to have to go to after I check out the pig, but I got to check out the pig. Um, so, let's see, what's their word of the day? 
California. Hey! Definition number one, a state where 60% of the registered voters and 100% of the unregistered voters are Democrats. Number two, it's a petri dish for fatally flawed toxic progressive moon battery. Uh, yeah, which is pretty much why I call it California. In their quotable quotes section, I would say this, and I've said it before, where the hell is the United States Congress? The, prop the Republicans control it. They need to um, hold hearings. They need to ask Mr. Rosenstein why he didn't recuse himself since he recommended that Comey be fired. They need to ask Mr. Mueller about those memos out of the Justice Department, and they need to ask Mr. Mueller, Mr. Mueller, I know it was Bueller, but that sounds fun, um, what authority he has to drag a president in front of the federal grand jury or subpoena him. You know, there's something about, um, about that actual position of POTUS that while they are in the commission of their duties or whatever, you cannot actually legally, according to the Constitution, yada yada, blah blah blah. <clears throat> in any case, so what authority does he have to even contemplate in indicting the POTUS? Nobody contemplated that while Dangleberry was in there. And how is it that he hasn't violated the appointments clause of the Constitution? Congress has a role for crying out loud. They're Article One. They were created first in the Constitution. They don't have to sit back and watch all this. They need to get involved in it. Now that's a quote from Mark Levine. And you know what? That's one of those things where they have been doing it this way for so long and now they have decided, well, I just don't, but we've been doing it this way forever. Yeah. So, ah, in their tasty tidbits. Do I want to read that? Ah, oh, that's a long one. That's a long one. Okay. So, this date in history, the 6th of June, 1932. The clown posse on Capitol Hill belatedly concludes that this automobile thing isn't a fad after all and decides to cash in with the first federal gas tax. Yay. This date in history, June the 6th, 1933. Passion Pit joins American Lexicon when first drive-in theater opens in New Jersey. And finally, this date in history, June the 6th, 1944. Allies decide to thrill the swastikas off the Third Reich by sending quality, spending quality time in France. Land 150,000 eager warriors on the beaches of Normandy. Propaganda goes on and on and on. And it is his story, not history. Just saying. So... Back to my pocket I go, because I just remembered another one. Where is that at? There it is. About the average American worker. Now this was published November of 2016, but... <coughs> Excuse me. Um... What? Oh, you assholios. Well, it's from Business Insider, and they're not letting me read the article because I have my ad blocker. Um, yeah, well, you assholes. In any case, the article was, The average American worker takes less vacation time than a medieval peasant. And I guess that's probably why I did not go to this article before, because sunny beaches? No, I'm not turning off my ad blocker, so kiss my ass. So, hmm, back to my pocket I go. Or actually, hey, you know what? I can read it from my pocket. <laughs> this was from businessinsider.com. Kiss my ass, guys. There's more ways than one. So, life for the medieval peasant was certainly no picnic. His life was shadowed by fear of famine, disease, and bursts of warfare. 
His diet and personal hygiene left much to be desired. But despite his reputation as a miserable wretch, you would envy him on one thing, his vacations. Plowing and harvesting were back-breaking toil, but the peasant enjoyed anywhere from eight weeks to half the year off. The church, mindful of how to keep a population from rebelling, enforced frequent mandatory holidays. Weddings, wakes, births might mean a week off quaffing ale to celebrate, and when wandering jugglers or sporting events came to town, the peasant expected time off for entertainment. There were labor-free Sundays, and when the plowing and harvesting seasons were over, the peasants got time to rest, too. In fact, economist Juliet Shore found that during periods of particularly high wages, such as 14th century England, peasants might put in no more than 150 days a year. As for the modern American worker, after a year on the job, he, she gets an average of eight vacation days annually. So, it wasn't supposed to turn out this way. John Maynard Keynes, one of the founders of modern economics, made a famous prediction that by 2030, advanced societies would be wealthy enough for th that leisure time rather than work would characterize national lifestyles. So far, that forecast is not looking good. That's basically because the military-industrial complex, just saying, <clears throat> and the banks. So what happened? Well, some cite the victory of the modern eight-hour-a-day, um, 40-hour work week over the punishing 70 to 80 hours a 19th century worker spent toiling as proof that we're moving in the right direction. Nah. But Americans have long since kissed the 40-hour work week goodbye. And Shore's examination of work patterns reveals that 19th century was an aberration in history of human labor. When workers fought for eight-hour workday, they weren't trying to get something radical and new, but rather to restore what their ancestors had enjoyed before industrial capitalists and the electric light bulb came on the scene. Wikimedia Commons um, states that go back 200, 300, or 400 years, and you find that most people did not work very long hours at all. In addition to relaxing during long holidays, the medieval peasant took his sweet time eating meals, and the day often included time for an afternoon snooze. The tempo of life was slow, even leisurely. The pace of work was relaxed. Our ancestors may not have been rich, but they had an abundance of leisure. Now fast forward to the 21st century, and the U.S. is the only advanced country with no national vacation policy whatsoever. So many American workers must keep on working through public holidays and vacation days. They often go unused. Even when we finally carve out a holiday, many of us answer emails and check in whether we're camping with the kids or trying to kick back on the beach. Some blame the American worker for not taking what is his or her due. But in a period of constantly high unemployment, job insecurity, and weak labor unions, employees may feel no choice but to accept the conditions set by the culture and the individual employer. In a world of at-will employment, where the work contract can be terminated at any time, it's not easy to raise objections. And it's true that the New Deal brought back some of the conditions that farm workers and artisans from the Middle Ages took for granted. But since the 1980s, things have gone steadily downhill. With secure long-term employment slipping away, People jump from job to job, so seniority no longer offers the benefits of additional days off, and the rising trend of hourly and part-time work, stoked by the Great Recession, 
means that many, for many, the idea of guaranteed vacation is a dim memory. And the consequences of constantly working? Well, ironically, this cult of endless toil doesn't really help the bottom line. Study after study shows that overworking reduces productivity. On the other hand, performance increases after a vacation, and workers come back with restored energy and focus. The longer the vacation, the more relaxed and energized people feel upon returning to the office. Economic crisis gives austerity-minded politicians excuses to talk of decreasing time off and increasing the retirement age and cutting into social insurance programs and safety nets that were supposed to allow us a fate better than working until we drop. In Europe, where workers average 25 to 30 days off per year, politicians like French's President Francois Hollande and former Greek Prime Minister um, and Antonis Samaras have sent signals that the culture of longer vacations is coming to an end. Well, you know, the slaves are getting a bit uppity, apparently. But the belief that shorter vacations bring economic gain doesn't appear to add up. According to the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, the Greeks, who face a horrible economy, work more hours than any other Europeans. In Germany, an economic powerhouse, workers rank second to last in numbers, number of hours worked. Despite more time off, German workers are the eighth most productive in Europe, while the long-toiling Greeks rank 24th out of 25 in productivity. Now, beyond burnout, vanishing vacations make our relationships with families and friends suffer. Our health is deteriorating. Depression and higher risk of death are among the outcomes of our no-vacation nation. Some forward-thinking people have tried to reverse this trend, like progressive economist Robert Reich, who has argued in favor of a mandatory three weeks off for all American workers. And Congressman Alan Grayson proposed the Paid Vacation Act of 2009, but alas, the bill didn't even make it to the floor of Congress. And you know why? Because Congress has invested in most of those companies that would have to pick up the tab, and they don't want to cut into their dividends that they're raking in. Pay no attention to the fact that Congress people have lots and lots of days off. You can't tell me they're working all that time. They're sitting around bullshitting, scratching each other's backs. But, speaking of Congress, its members seem to be the only people in America getting as much downtime as a medieval peasant. In recent years, they've gotten upward of 239 days in vacation time. Yeah. It's no wonder. You know, it's kind of like uh, why they don't wish to... I'm going to go ahead and grab this link. And I know if you wish to shut off your ad blocker or whatever to read it, fine. But, yeah. Uh, I don't know that they really took vacations, Grimmy, but they did have downtime. I mean, there's just so many times you cannot harvest during certain times of the year, so I don't know. I don't know for sure if they really did, but eh. I do remember seeing films and videos when I was a child of the 21st century and how everything was going to be so cool and and you weren't going to have to work so hard and you're going to have all of these labor-saving devices and yada 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 that world ain't here. That investment money went into the big industrial complex of the military. So, yeah. Doesn't surprise me one bit. Okay. 
now. Let me see. I think I have. Do, 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 do. I thought I read something on Cracked earlier today, but maybe, maybe I didn't put it in my pocket because I didn't think, and no. So, how about I go check out Oopy? Because I have just a little bit of time left. So let's go check out Oopy. See what's going on on UPI. Dot com. Wow. Wow. Holy smokes. Um, from UPI. Workers at a Kansas convenience store are being praised for tracking down the rightful owners of a $1 million lottery ticket left at the store. Cal Patel, whose parents own the Pit Stop store in Salina, said clerk Andy Patel called him March 18th after an, a customer who came in to check their lottery tickets accidentally left one of the tickets unchecked, and it turned out to be a $1 million winner. Sweet! Patel, who is not related to Andy, said that he decided to drive around the neighborhood to see if he could find the ticket owner who's a regular customer. Yes? Hi, Java, 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 Doctor 2. Yes, Grimmy, I do believe Congress should get 365 days a year off. And we could put them up in Great Bar Hilton. I hear we have lots of accommodations. In any case, um, back to this article. I knew it was a longtime customer who had left it here, he told the Salina Journal, and they didn't know that they had a winning ticket. So they never would have known if I hadn't found them. But then you'd have to live through the guilt of that all your life. So I went into the neighborhood where I knew he lived, but I couldn't find him. And the cars weren't outside or anything, and I couldn't find their house as to exactly which one it was. Patel said he returned to the store in the hope that the customer would come back, and he decided to take a second drive later in the day and spotted the customer driving with his brother. I showed them the ticket and told them that they were winners, and they started shaking. They couldn't believe it. Patel said that the customer returned to the store where the ticket was returned to the rightful owner, and I, I felt really good. I believe in good karma and bad karma, and that was one of the instances of good karma where good karma would come around at some point in life. Patel was presented with $1,200 Helping Hands Reward from Devin James Injury Lawyers for his honesty. So thank you so much, Devin James and everyone else at the firm. This means a lot, and we'll continue what we're doing here. Thank you so much. That is pretty frickin' awesome. Pretty awesome. See, there are awesome people in this world. And I hope whoever it was that had the winning lottery ticket also rewards him. Because he really didn't have to do that. Not by our current standards. So I think that's pretty freaking awesome. I think they should at least give him 10 grand. At least. I mean, isn't that the maximum you can give someone without them having to declare it on their taxes? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything about taxes other than their theft. But you know, you win something like that and they're on you like stink on shit. So, this is still pretty awesome. That's just cool. And it's here in Kansas, in Salina. That could have been me. <laughs> when was that ticket purchased? <laughs> Oh, uh, actually, the young man looks like a clerk that works at one that in my daughter's neighborhood. So, eh, how cool. In any case, let's see. What else can I find on Oopy? I just think that one is pretty freaking awesome. Okay. Oh, Miss Kate. One for Flory. Duh. Hmm. 
Missing zoo animals found in Florida man's apartment. Film at 11. <laughs> Police in Florida said that they arrested a man found to be keeping seven of 11 stolen animals from a co excuse me college's teaching zoo in his apartment. Santa Fe College Police said that Cedric Price, 20, was arrested Tuesday after investigators found three Florida box turtles, two red-footed to uh, tortoises, and a skink and a squirrel monkey <laughs> in his Gainesville apartment. Six of the animals were stolen sometime between the evening of May 29th and the morning of May 30th from the Santa Fe College Teaching Zoo, police said. And one of the box to turtles, along with two gopher, gopher tortoises, really, and two other box turtles, were taken a week earlier. Now the other two box turtles and gopher tortoises remain missing. Investigators say. It's a great collaboration of efforts from the community. SFPD chief Ed Book said in a statement released by the school. We are grateful for the many tips that we received from the public, as well as the coordinated efforts of the Aluch Alachua, is that how you say that? Alachua, whatever, the county sheriff's office, and the college community that led to the rescue of these animals. The teaching zoo director, Jonathan Miot, said that officials remain hopeful that the still missing animals will be recovered. Hopefully he did not consume them because I do know people that like to make turtle soup. Just saying. They could quite possibly have been consumed. <laughs> uh... What is that? $999, oh, $9,999.99. Ooh. Yeah, I'm not sure how, mm, I'm not sure what it is, but it's bullshit, whatever it is. God dang it, what the hell? It's all just frickin' Monopoly money anyway. Oh, well. <laughs> Well, now if this ain't wackadoodle, I don't know what is. Okay. Um. Oh, no. Stop it. Uh, man uses inflatable unicorn to rescue rescue gosling from snapping turtle. Hmm. How cool. Apparently, an Iowa man who spotted a gosling being attacked by a snapping turtle in a pond used a giant inflatable unicorn to float out and rescue the bird. Kerry Coppola said that he and his family were driving past the pond on west or in West Des Moines when his wife spotted the baby goose struggling in the water. Coppola said he borrowed the inflatable unicorn from his brother's house and returned to the pond where he floated out and discovered the gosling was being held by the jaws of a snapping turtle. Coppola was able to bring the gosling back to shore where it rejoined its family. Ah, and there is film at 11. There's a video attached so you can watch this heroic rescue. I'm thinking the turtle was probably hangry. Very hangry. And it was thinking, goose. I won't cook it, but goose. Hmm. <clears throat> Let's see what else is on here. Oh, and one for Moosey. One for Moosey. <laughs> A loose moose runs wild through Idaho City. <laughs> oh, moose girl! A moose spotted running loose through the an Idaho City was shot with a tranquilizer dart and relocated to a safer area, officials said. The Idaho Department of Fish and Games at the Ponticello, or no, Pocatello, police department responded at about 11 a.m. Tuesday when witnesses reported a yearling moose running loose through the old town area. 
Well, it was a yearling moose, so it was obviously not either one of Moosey's boys. Now, wildlife officers caught up with the moose at Memorial Park, but two attempts to shoot the female moose with tranquilizer darts failed. The moose fled down the city street, and officials were finally able to shoot it with a dart on the third attempt. Third time's charm. And the moose settled down and fell asleep in a resident's backyard. Officials said the moose was relocated to a safer area away from residences and roads. Hmm. There's a moose on the loose. Dun, dun, dun. And guess what? There's another moose article. Holy smokes! Oh, we gotta check this shit out. This was from uh, May 29th. A loose moose wanders parking lot at Newfoundland Airport. Huh. Apparently a visitor to the Newfoundland Airport captured video of an apparently lost moose wandering around the hub's parking lot. Katie Jackson tweeted the video she captured Sunday afternoon in the parking lot of St. John's International Airport. There's a moose on the loose in the airport, she surp <laughs> a surprised and amused Jackson says in the video. And she joked that the moose must have just arrived on a flight and was trying to find its car. Now where did I park? Which, yeah, I've, mm, uh, yeah, I understand that. <laughs> That's just pretty cute. Pretty cute. Okay, I'll share this one too. Moosey! <laughs> there you go. No, I wasn't calling Moosey loose. <laughs> I did not say she was a loose moose. I said there was a moose on the loose. There's a difference. <laughs> oh, how funny. Too funny. Those mooseys, they're just rather rambunctious, aren't they? <laughs> okay. We got to do this one. I mean, the critters are getting the best of us. Uh, that's all there is to it. Apparently, man chasing an escaped parrot gets stuck in tree. I thought it was the cats that were supposed to get stuck in trees. Firefighters in England said that they rescued a man who became stuck up a tree while trying to chase down an escaped parrot. Michael Novell, a crew manager at the Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Services Walkingham road fire station said that his crew responded last week on a report of a man and a parrot stuck up a tree in early we have an angry parrot that flew from its cage out of the window and into the tree novell told get reading and the owner gave chase and we had to get them both down we managed to get the man down but unfortunately the parrot made a bid for freedom and succeeded a Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service spokesman said that it took about 35 minutes to rescue the man using a ladder, and the large green parrot remained on the loose. Now, a woman who lives in the same area posted photos to the local Lost and Found Pets group on Facebook showing a green parrot that she said landed on her head and appeared to be injured. It was unclear whether it was the same bird. Well... Is that all it did when it landed on your head? I hope so. Loose critters. There's critters running around loose everywhere. What? Yes, kitty cats are very athletic as well, Rob. <laughs> they are... I've watched slow motion video of like a cat jumping out of a... Wow. 
It's really pretty freaking amazing. But it's also pretty freaking amazing to watch a cat that's trying to jump from a table onto a chair and doesn't account for the tablecloth that's on the table. And so it does not really get good traction. It just goes plump. So, yeah. <laughs> you shall not pass. Kitty cats are so funny. So, cats can do things that dogs can't, like climb. Oh, I beg to differ. Gunder, the uh, golden retriever, could climb a ladder. Because when we re-roofed our house, Gunder was sitting on the peak of the house. And since our house was on the corner, um, the police wound up coming by and saying, Would you please get the dog down because we're afraid he's going to cause an accident and people stare and are not paying attention and yeah but gunder liked heights in any case <clears throat> apparently cats can perform all kinds of truly astonishing and heart-stopping feats yes they can kitty cats are wild and crazy okay unlike the kitty cat that's on my lap right now who's trying to give me hugs with claws it's not cool with claws sweetheart um Let's see. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, one more critter on the loose for now. This one is uh, escaped bulls fight in the middle of a California street. Hey, <laughs> no bull shit. Apparently, police in California shared a photo of a fight between two escaped bulls that played out in the middle of a residential area. The Fremont police officer posted the photo to Facebook and Twitter showing the two bulls locking horns in the middle of Castro Lane. That was about 9.30 a.m. Tuesday. When an active bullfight comes out over the radio, police wrote, meetings take pause and everyone listens for the next update, which, yeah. Police and animal control officers responded to the scene and the owner of the animals soon arrived to help move the two back to their property. <laughs> Seriously, that's how it's spelled, too. Police spokeswoman uh, Geneva Basquez said that the owner was issued two $100 citations, one for each escaped bull. So see, your bull does cost you and will be responsible for footing the bill for property damage, including toppled fences and dented cars. She said that the bulls are legal to keep in the city, but police rarely hear of one escaping. Really? You can't keep a bull in... Wow. I can't remember a bull being loose, she told the East Bay Times, and a bullfight in the street is a first for sure. <laughs> Which, yeah... Oh, good Lord. And, uh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I do see another one that's like, oh, wow. We've gone to the animals. <laughs> that's okay, because this shit's fun. Okay. And lastly. <laughs> Deputy dodges determined cow in dash cam footage. Say that three times fast. That was from April of this year. Apparently authorities in Texas shared video of a daring deputy deftly dodging a runaway cow that became agitated after being, uh, after being butt by a car. I think butted by a car, maybe hit by a car. Apparently, the Harris County Precinct 3 Constable's Office said Deputy Andrew Rise uh, pulled over when he saw two vehicles parked on the shoulder, indicating that there may have been an accident. Now, he determined one of the vehicles had apparently collided with a cow that was on the ground, but did not appear to be seriously injured. A video posted to Facebook by the constable's office shows the cow getting up from the ground and charging at the officer who fled around his patrol vehicle and the vehicle's dashboard camera recorded as the cow made a second run at the deputy and bumped the front of his vehicle. The cow eventually fled into the nearby woods and its current origins or current whereabout is unknown. So, <laughs> it was a... 
headbutt and run. How in the hell did he get away with that shit? <laughs> we can handle criminals with no problem, but when it comes to livestock, it's no bull, the constable's office quipped. Please be advised, there were no humans, animals, or patrol cars damaged in the making of this dash cam. <laughs> and there is a video attached to it. So, wow, too funny. <laughs> Goodness. What's that? Oh, okay. Wow. I needed a sip of water. So, dang, I am out of time. Whee! That last little bit went fast. Of course, we went to the animals, but that's okay. So, y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com, channel 3. Also on the Real Liberty Media, um, or the RLM Spreaker channel, RLM TuneIn Radio Station, lots of RLM and number number places. Later to be on the RLM YouTube channel and the RLM BitChute channel. Um, I will be back on Friday for the Freaker Friday edition of Grammy's Rocket Chair. But until then, y'all have an absolutely amazing rest of your evening. I know as soon as I get done here, I still have some daylight and I got some gardening to get done. So, um, y'all have an absolutely awesome rest of your evening and a totally splendiferous Thoys day. Because, yeah, tomorrow's going to be one of the, it's going to be warm, but... It's one of those days where I get to stay home all day. So far, as far as I know, I get to stay home. So I'm going to be playing out in the yard tomorrow. So I will catch up with y'all in the funny papers. Please remember, I truly do love you all. And I wish you all enough. Even if it's just a little bit on the bullshittery side. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>